Hi guys. <clears throat> it is a spectacularly gorgeous, over the top, beautiful, going on 75, 77 degree, windy January day uh, where we have made it to the fifth day of 2020. That would be Sunday morning. Uh, January 5th, 2020. So what I love about Sunday is that I get to wear two hats here in the YouTube Doomosphere and uh, bring you the first combination Doomsday Sermon for Sunday, January 5th, which will also stand in as the Monday, January 6th, Chronicle of the Collapse. And I think it was alert listener Pat Anderson, I believe, sent me this long uh, article from Vox Magazine or the Vox.com website, which, <coughs> as well as anything I have ever read about <coughs> this whole joke of this one and a half degree or even two degree C target. So this is, uh, what is the reality of uh, this absolute joke uh, here at the beginning of 2020? I've got to put the little dog over in his own chair. Uh, this article on Vox, is by an environmental journalist. I might have, I can't remember if I've read one of these fellows' articles before. His name is David Roberts, journalist David Roberts, who spends his life looking at stories like this. And <coughs> I need to get David here on the show, but while I'm working on that, let's hear what David and Vox have to say about the sad truth. The sad truth. Sounds like Mad Max is arriving here. Maybe Mad Max has erupted finally in Garfield, Texas. The sad truth about our boldest climate target. Yes, our boldest. Uh, that's not exactly the word I would use, but anyway. Just in case you have forgotten, in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, the countries participating in the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change agreed to a common target to hold the rise, the, to hold the rise in global average temperatures well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to one and a half degree Celsius. The lower end of that range, one and a half degree C, has become a cause celeb among climate activists. Can that target still be met? Well, take a look at this animation from Carbon Brief. I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put the link to this so you can look at what Carbon Brief has to say. But this is roughly what uh, this is Carbon Brief's uh, pathway to one and a half C in 2027. This is a very good graph of not only, uh, th this is just, this graph I think from Carbon Brief just pretty much summarizes the whole future of uh, global industrial civilization and the planet. Uh, but anyway, getting back <coughs> to the essay, no graphic I have ever seen better captures humanity's climate situation. 
if we had if we had peaked and begun steadily reducing emissions 20 years ago, the necessary the necessary pace of reductions would have been around 3% a year, which is well realistic is too strong, but it still it still would have required rapid coordinated action of a kind never seen before in human history, but it was at least possible to envision, you, you know, at the turn of the uh, of this century. We did not, though. We knew about climate change. There were scientists yelling themselves blue in the face, but we did not turn the wheel. Global em emissions have only risen since then. Humanity has put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 1988 when climate scientist James Hansen first testified to Congress about the danger of climate change than it did in all of prior history. Once again, we have put, humanity has dumped more CO2 into this atmosphere since 1988 than humanity did in its 200,000 year history before 1988. Yeah, like we're going to turn this freight train around. <clears throat> now, you know, n not, not since 1988, but now, uh, here in the opening bell of 2020. Now, to hit one and a half degree, emissions would need to fall off a cliff, falling, you know, not by 3% a year, but by 15% per year every year, starting in 2020 until they hit net zero. That is probably not going to happen. I have no idea why the word probably is showing in there. Everyone, including this man uh, and the editors of Vox, know damn well there is no chance in hell of that happening. That's probably uh, not going to happen. Temperature is almost certainly going to rise more than one and a half C. A lot of climate activists are extremely averse to saying so. In fact, many of them, many of these climate activists will be angry with me for saying so because they believe that admitting to this looming probability carries with it all sorts of dire consequences and implication. Lots of people in the climate world, not just activists and politicians, but scientists, journalists, and everyday concerned citizens have talked themselves into a kind of forced public facing optimism hmm. despite the fears that dog their private thoughts. They believe that without that public optimism the fragile effort to battle climate change will collapse completely. I don't think that's true, but I can't claim to know it is not true. Nobody really knows what might work to get the public worked up about climate change the way the problem deserves. You know, this reminds me, I, I interviewed this, uh, my buddy Henry Holt, 
who was down there literally living in Malakuta, Australia, while that firestorm was getting ready to engulf the town of Malakuta, Australia. And the day before that happened, while Henry and his wife and kids were getting the hell out of Malakuta, he noticed all of these tourists bringing in their campers to go, uh, you know, to go camping on the beach and people out walking their dogs and having their morning coffee as a firestorm was getting ready to engulf their town. I think that might be uh, what we're talking about here. Nobody really knows what might work to get the public worked up about climate change the way the problem deserves. Maybe advocates really do need to maintain a happy warrior, a happy warrior spirit. Maybe a bunch of doer doomsaying really will turn off the public. But it is not the job of those of us in the business of observation and analysis to make the public feel or do things. That's what activists do. We, we owe the public our best judgment of the situation even if it might make them sad. And from where I am sitting, it looks like the one and a half sea goal is utterly forlorn. It looks like, you know, to this journalist, it looks like we have already locked in levels of climate change that scientists predict will be devastating. I don't like it. I don't accept it. But I see it and I reject the notion that I should be silent about it for public relations purposes. In this post, I will quickly review how 1.5C came to be the new activist target and some reasons to believe it might already be out of reach. Then I will ponder what it means to admit that, what follows from it, and what it might and what it means for the fight ahead. Okay, so how did one and a half C become the last chance? The new target adopted in Paris reflected a growing conviction among scientists and activists that two degrees C, the target that had served as a kind of default for years, was in no way safe. Climate change at that level would in fact be extremely dangerous. Thus, the addition of efforts efforts to hit one and a half C. But it wasn't until last year that the world really got a clear sense of how much worse 2 to C, 2 C about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, would be than one and a half C, otherwise known as 2.7 degree Fahrenheit after the IPCC released its special report on the subject, its findings were grim. Even one and a half C is likely to entail high multiple interrelated climate risks for some vulnerable regions, including small islands in least developed countries. <clears throat> All of those impacts become much worse at 2 degrees C. Severe heat events, can you say Sydney, Australia, will become 2.6 times worse, 
plant invertebrate species loss, two times worse, insect species loss, three times worse, and decline in marine fisheries two times worse rather than 70 to 90 percent of coral reefs dying 99 percent will die many vulnerable and low-lying areas will become uninhabitable and refugee flows will radically increase we've heard this laundry list how many times and so on at two degrees C climate change will be devastating for large swaths of the globe and and of course anybody believing at this point that we're not going to blow right on through two degree C uh, anyway still I'm sorry sorry in short there is no safe level of global warming. Climate change is not something bad that might happen. It is something bad that is happening. Global average temperatures have risen about 1.3 C from pre-industrial levels and California and don't forget Australia are all ready, ready burning. Still, each additional increment of heat, each fraction of a degree will make things worse. Specifically, two degrees will be much worse than one and a half, and two and a half will be much worse than two C, and so on as it gets hotter. The aforementioned IB, IPCC report is the source of the much quoted notion that we only have, well now 11 years, or now is it 10 years I guess, to avoid catastrophic climate change, oh, which I suppose, you know, now that it's 2020, is only 10 years. That slogan is, is derived from the report's conclusion that to have any chance of limiting temperature rise to one and a half C, global emissions must fall at least 50% by 2030. And of course, I would say they would need to have fallen 100% by 1988, but we won't go there. <coughs> That goal, the, the official IPCC goal, <clears throat> a 10-year mobilization to cut global carbon emissions in half has now become the rallying cry of the global climate movement and the organizing principle of the Green New Deal. <clears throat> but it is now time to get honest about one and a half C. <clears throat> Climate hawks, along with numerous recent scientific and economic reports, including the IPCC's, emphasize that limiting global warming to one and a half C is still possible. Yes, right. Physically and economically possible with technology and resources we now possess. And according to this man, it's true. As the IPCC showed with sufficient torturing, sufficient torturing of climate economic models, it is still possible to construct a pathway whereby emissions decline at the needed rate. Such scenarios generally involve everything going just right. Every policy is passed in every sector. 
every technology pans out. We take no wrong turns and encounter no coals de sac. And climate sensitivity, the amount temperature changes in response to greenhouse gases turns out to be on the lower end of scientific estimates. If we roll straight sixes for long enough, we can still win this. And this is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, I guess if we, every time we roll the dice, uh, for the next 10 years, with every single roll of the dice, we come up with double sixes uh, without one other dice showing up. We can do this, which is another way of saying this is a complete joke. The odds are not with us. Anyway, that that slogan from the IPCC meant to summarize this state of affairs has been around with variations for decades. We have all the tools we need. All, all we lack is the political will. <coughs> but political will, whatever that is, is not some final item on the grocery list to be checked off once everything else is in the cart. It is everything. You know, it is everything in the cart. None of the rest of it, none of the available policies and technologies means anything without it. It cannot be, this is political will, cannot be avoided, short-circuited, or wished away. After all, it is, pos it is possible to end global poverty in a decade or even less. We have the technology to do it. It's called money. The people who have more could give enough to those with less so that everyone had a decent life. Similarly, it's possible to end global homelessness, habitat destruction, hunger, and war. The resources exist. All we lack is the political will. But we have not ended those things. There are lots and lots of ways to reduce suffering that are possible and have been possible for a long time, and we still don't do them. We don't even do a fraction of what we could do to reduce immediate, visible suffering much less the suffering of future generations and far-off populations, it turns out to be extraordinarily difficult to generate and effectively deploy the political power needed to secure beneficial policies and then hold them in place over time. <clears throat> Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, guys, I, this turned out to be longer than I thought. Uh, and climate change is different from those other large-scale problems for two reasons. First, it's not that progress is swinging around too slow, it's that there is very little progress at all. 
for all the frenzy around renewable energy in recent years, the best we've seen able to do is slightly slow the rise in global emissions. We are still traveling headlong in the wrong direction with centuries of momentum at our backs. Secondly, and consequently, the level of action and coordination necessary to limit global warming to one and a half C utterly dwarfs anything that has ever happened on any other large-scale problem that humanity has ever f faced. The only analogy that ever comes even close to capturing what is necessary is wartime mobilization. But this requires imagining the kind of mobilization that the U.S. achieved for less than one decade during World War II happening in every large economy at one time and sustaining itself for the remainder of the century. Emissions have never fallen at 15% annually anywhere, much less everywhere. And what earthly reason do we have to believe that emissions will start plunging this year? Look around. The democratic world is in the grips of a populist authoritarian backlash that shows no sign of resolving itself anytime soon. Oil and gas infrastructure is being built at a furious pace. Hundreds of new coal power plants are in the works. No country has implemented anything close to the policies necessary to establish an emissions trajectory toward one and a half degrees C. Many, including the U.S. and Brazil, are in fact hurtling in the other direction. Just focusing on the U.S., there is more than a 50-50 chance that Donald Trump will be re-elected in 2020 in case, in which case we are all, and I cannot stress this enough, doomed. Even if Dems take the presidency in both houses of Congress, serious federal action will have to contend with the filibuster, then the midterm backlash, then the next election, and more, and more broadly, the increasingly conservative federal courts and Supreme Court, the Electoral College, the flood of money in politics, and the over-representation of rural states in the South. The U.S., like many other countries, is balanced on a knife's edge of partisanship. It's growing demographics frustrated by structural barriers. It's direction uncertain and its policies and institutions increasingly unstable. Does a sudden and thorough about face in social, economic, and political practice feel like something that is in the offing this year? It doesn't feel like that to me. <clears throat> the difficulty of envisioning such a thing has led climate hawks like Al Gore to place their hopes on unpredictable social tipping points invisible thresholds that, once breached, will allegedly yield radical change. Back in 2012, Al Gore told me, we're not at the tipping point, 
but we're much closer than we have been. For as long as I can remember, people have been pointing out signs that such a tipping point is in the offing, counting the number of street protests or the number of times TV news anchors say the word climate or the number of city officials endorsing 2030 goals, but global emissions just continue rising. Uh, but hoping for a radical, unprecedented break in human history is very different from having a reasonable expectation that such a thing will take place, lightning striking in the same spot 100 times is possible, a room full of monkeys with typewriters producing a Shakespeare play is possible, human beings shifting the course of their global civilization on a dime is possible, but it probably will not happen. We have waited too long. Practically speaking, we are heading past 1.5C as we speak, and probably past 2C as well. This is not a fact in the same way climate science deals in facts. Collective human behavior is not nearly so easy to predict as biophysical cycles, but nothing we know about human history, sociology, or politics suggests that vast screeching changes in collective direction are likely. What bothers me about the forced optimism that has become de rigueur in climate circles is that it excludes the tragic dimension of climate change and thus robs it of the gravity it deserves. That is the thing. The story of climate change is all ready a tragedy. It's sad, really sad. People are suffering, species are dying off, entire ecosystems are being lost, and it is inevitably going to get worse. We are in the midst of making the earth a simpler, cruder, less hospitable place, not only for ourselves, but for all the kaleidoscopic varieties of life that have evolved here in a relatively stable climate. The most complex and most idiosyncratic forms of life are now most at risk. The mosquitoes and jellyfish will prop will prosper. That is simply the background condition of our existence as a species now, even if we rally to avoid the worst outcomes. But uh, anyway, guys, this goes on and on and on and on and on. And uh, let's just jump down to the very uh, bottom. Uh, okay, we're going to jump down. I'm going to put the link on here. And, and I went through, I skipped over a lot. I mean, this man has written a book. But getting to the bottom of his fine essay, all of those problems are going to get worse. We need to grapple with that squarely because the real th 
threat is that these escalating impacts overwhelm our ability not just to mitigate greenhouse gases, but to even care or react to disasters when they happen elsewhere. Right now, much of Australia is on fire. Half a billion animals have likely died since September, and it is barely breaking the news cycle in the U.S. Uh, well, that at least has changed. That shrinking of empathy is arguably the greatest danger facing the human species, the biggest barrier to the collective action necessary to save ourselves. I cannot help but think that the first step in defending and expanding that empathy is reckoning squarely with how much damage we have already done and are likely to do, working through the guilt and grief and resolving to minimize the suffering to come. Yes, resolving the, to minimize the suffering to come. Uh, anyway, uh, amen, David Roberts. And, uh, anyway, I smell smoke on the air. The, the wind is blowing about 40 miles an hour in Garfield, Texas, and, and, and someone uh, is out burning, uh, burning their garbage uh, while the wind uh, blows across Garfield. Uh, you, you, you know, guys, yeah, speaking of minimizing the suffering, uh, I guess the, the, the vultures are finally picking the final bones of uh, that possum that I'm pretty sure it was that guy raising fighting cocks behind me shot that possum, I guess, to minimize the suffering of his fighting cocks. <sighs> Minimizing suffering of our fellow earthlings, please. Anyway, I've got to wrap this up because uh, I have an interview with this fellow Ted Rall, R-A-L-L, -L, uh, tomorrow, and uh, this should really, uh, I, I just can't wait. But anyway, get out there <clears throat> and minimize some suffering. While you still can on this gorgeous day here in the end times. Can you see the uh, crested Kara Kara picking the last bones of the murdered possum? Bye, guys.